cleaning my tires, nothing to see here. Hey, how's it going? So you may have noticed it's been a few days since I published anything. We've had a little bit of uh, what I'm gonna call weather delays. It was snowing for a while, then it was like 18 degrees, then the snow kind of melted, then it snowed again, and then it dumped two inches of rain in 10 hours overnight one night. So everything out here was flooded. The bus was basically parked in a lake, standing water. Today though, I did manage to make some progress with the power inverter system and probably a few other things I'm not thinking of right now. So I figured I'd at least post a shorter video. I've got a few clips that I've filmed with my phone over the last week or so. Give you something to stare at at least. Little bits of progress are being made. Like I've said before, some of it isn't really conducive to making a video because it's moving screws or changing settings or moving some wires or cutting holes in things. Anyways, I did film all of it with my phone. The audio is a little bit challenging on it. The audio levels are about the same, but you'll notice from clip to clip it goes from normal sound to sound like I'm talking in a can. I fixed it as best I could. But anyways, here you go. Enjoy some progress of the last week or so. I was gonna say something else, but I don't know what. Anyways, here you go. Oh, don't worry, the snow's not done yet. Um, yeah. At least it's not very cold. Hopefully all this garbage falling from the sky will melt. Man, check out the steering angle on this thing. I just needed to move it over a little bit so I could get to the uh, the bay that has all the batteries and stuff in it, but I've never seen it from the outside with the steering cranked all the way. That's uh, not doing too bad. I managed to move the bus just enough here so I can get to this luggage bay, which has our inverter and batteries in it. And I've got a heat gun that pulls 14 amps. We're going to plug it into this thing. And I've got my DC clamp ammeter here just to kind of see what kind of amperage we're pulling from the batteries. Also, I'm going to be insulating these terminals here because they're kind of close to exposed metal and doing a little bit of cable management, tying some stuff off and also installing some fuses in here. But for right now, Let's go ahead and fire this thing up and see what kind of amperage we're dealing with on the DC side when we've got basically 1500 watts being pulled. Okay, we've got our clamp ammeter on here. Let's zero the thing out. There we go. Turn on our breakers and then power up the inverter. And now we can plug in our load. Here we go. And we'll go ahead and put this on the low and see what we get. Only pulling four amps. Something tells me the heating element might be bad in this thing. Well, let's just turn it on high. Okay, they were pulling 84 amps. Let me turn it down. Okay, so the coil on this thing uh, only works on high. Let's take a look at our inverter and see what it's showing on the screen. Okay, I'm gonna turn it on high. Back to low. And now it's off. I'm gonna go ahead and review that footage and uh, see what that display was showing and if it's anything close to this. Always with the geese. I just reviewed the footage and it said we were at 51% load, which makes sense. That thing's 14 amps, roughly 1500 watts or something. This thing's rated for a sustained 3000 watts. So yeah, math checks out. The most load I'm ever gonna have pulling on this thing is probably like the microwave or the toaster oven. And then if the fridge is also on, uh, maybe a computer or the stove or something too, that could get us up closer to 2000 watts. But 80 amps at 50% load 
Seems about right. All right, cool. We've successfully tested this thing. Yay. Now I need to get to work cleaning up some of this because it was raining profusely when this was all being installed and there's a wee bit of cleanup that needs to be done. Also, there's some garbage back there that needs to go away. Interesting note, the brand of pellets you use in your pellet stove makes a significant difference in the heat output. So I have been using these pellets here. They are Green Supreme. Um, I don't know if it's a local company that makes them, but yeah, they seem to work pretty good. The supplier that I normally get those from was out of stock and they were substituting the Blazer brand pellets. I'll show a picture of what that bag looks like. Typically when this stove is running on the medium setting, which it is right now, it will heat up the inside of this bus to 70 degrees within about 60 to 90 minutes at the very most when it's about freezing outside. This thing has now been running on medium for four hours and it is currently only 56 degrees in here. Yeah. It makes sense. Uh, different woods burn at different temperatures. And apparently whatever they put in the blazer stuff is not worth having. I've got one bag of these green ones left and I just bought 10 bags of the blazer ones. So I'm kind of mixing those in a little bit and yeah, but at this point, at this burn rate, I'm gonna be going through probably two bags every 24 hours. Anyways, there you go. It does make a difference. do we have going on out here? Remember this thing? This was the second one that the compressor's locked up in. I've been waiting for my replacement one to show up so that I could use a packaging and send this one back. Well, the replacement magically appeared. I had actually completely given up on getting this thing because, well, I hadn't heard anything in two weeks and they wouldn't respond to my emails. Anyways, here's the new one. As you can see, it's taken apart. Um, <laughs> this one had a couple of minor issues. Some of the screws are bent and there's some broken plastic. The broken plastic on this one wasn't nearly as bad as the last one. There's some cracks that kind of go around here. One of the handles that was on the side of the unit had snapped off and went inside. And yeah. Anyways, this one I plugged it in. I let, I let it sit overnight. Plugged it in, turned it on, compressor seems to run. Cool. But the pump for the water expulsion system was on all the time. So I took the lid off and this little float switch was stuck up like that. Now as it turns out, this tube that ran in there ran underneath the float so it could never go back down all the way. So I got that fixed. And then this little dingly pump over here, they drove some eye screws or eyelet hooks through the bottom and use springs to attach it. That was vibrating like crazy, but um, I got that fixed now. As you can see, it's not actually hitting anything. Rerouted the hose. I think this one should be all right. Um, we've got a little more temperature protection stuff in here, maybe? Well, I don't know. I'm going to plug this thing in, see how it works, and then depending on what it needs or whatever, maybe do the switch or change it with parts from that one. Cause the case on that one's perfect. I thought about swapping the innards over and keeping those plastics, but then I realized you'd have to move a refrigeration system, which is pretty delicate while it's charged and not break any of the lines. So I think, oh, here's, here's some more plastic. What is this? We've got a star washer down here from somewhere. Come here, you. I wonder what that came off of. Anyways, I'm still doing my inspection on this thing. It does seem to run, but the beauty about this is if, thing doesn't work, if this thing doesn't work, it was free. So yeah, who cares? <laughs>
<laughs> We've tentatively powered up this system. I've got an extension cord plugged into the AC input, which should activate the battery charger in this thing. And according to the display, we are charging the battery. So what I wanna do is see how many amps we're pulling on the AC input side here. Okay, looks like we're pulling about seven amps off of the AC input. Let's check and see what our charge rate of the batteries are. All right, cool. I set the charger to 20% of its available charging power. So it looks like we're putting Make sure that's zeroed. Yeah, we're putting just under two amps into these batteries. All right, cool. This thing's capable of charging the batteries at 35 amps, but uh, I tamed it down quite a bit just because these batteries, well, it's not freezing out here, but they're not super warm. I don't know if this has temperature compensation. I don't think it would because the inside of this thing is gonna be warm compared to where the batteries are. So for now, since we're 43 degrees out here or something, and these batteries have been pretty cold over the last week or so, but I just wanted to test and make sure. We've just got extension cords running right now. We've got one for the output and one for the input. This is just for testing purposes, because I wanted to get this thing fired up. I've got a new one of these control panels on the way, and it connects via this RS-485 port right here. And I'm gonna run that up inside the bus here. That way I can control the inverter from there. But it looks like right now, when you power up the input or the 110 volt input to the thing, it powers up the unit and then automatically activates the battery charger. I plug this orange cord, which is a supply, into a switchable outlet just so I could turn it on and off while I'm down here. I can't do that while I'm recording because I have to use the same phone to do that. But anyways, seems to work. Cool. The rest of my electrical stuff's getting delivered today and I've got the breaker box and everything all set up. So I'm going to be able to do a little bit more wire management, cable management down here with these batteries. I've got some wiring harness wrap and a bunch of other stuff we're gonna do as well as installing a couple additional fuses in this battery system. But that stuff will be here sometime in the next few hours and then we will get to work. All right, things have been delivered. We got uh, 50 feet of this stuff. It's a sort of fabric nylon-y weave material, but it opens up and you can wrap it around cables like this so we can give it a little bit more protection. Then I also got a whole bunch of this cloth, um, like electrical tape stuff. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap up and protect some of these cables here. Anyways, I got a little piece here. I'm gonna test and see how this stuff works and then I'll be back when I make some progress. Well, it started raining as always, but we've made some progress here. We got an insulating piece of wood on here. We've got these cables wrapped. We've got these cables wrapped going down here. I was just getting ready to install the auxiliary fuses and well, water's from falling from the sky. So we're gonna call this good for right now and I'll be back in a little bit. And I got what little bit done today that I could. It's starting to get dark now and cold and rainy and all that stuff. I've got some more lumber here. Ironically, it is drying because the place it was at was outside in the ice and snow. So got a bunch of this now and we're gonna use this to build that other desk slash power distribution cabinet. This is the electrical panel I'm gonna be using. I kind of tentatively got it set up, but probably gonna be a few changes with this once I actually get it in there. I'm ready to wire up the output of the inverter to a, some sort of panel inside the bus though. Among other things, I went ahead and got this PVC flexible wiring pigtail thing. This is what you'd use to connect like water heaters or pool pumps or something like that. But it's, uh, it's significant enough gauge wire that it's gonna be good. Six feet is long enough. And this has, where is it? It's got this little elbow here that will integrate nicely with the holes on the side of this box. So I think we're gonna wind up using this 
It's either eight or six gauge, I forget which, but this will handle all the amperage we're gonna be dealing with with that inverter. And then also, we're gonna be doing some maintenance on the wheelchair lift, including changing the oil in it. I managed to get some of this aviation, it's the 5606 hydraulic oil to use for the lift. Most people say, oh, why are you doing that? Just to use ATF, like automatic transmission fluid. It technically will work, it is hydraulic, but sometimes ATF can wreak havoc on some of the seals. And the main thing with this is when it gets cold outside, it stays the same viscosity. But anyways, we got a gallon of that. This was $45 for this. So I'm pretty sure we won't need more than this. One other thing that I knew was going on is obviously when you have 50 feet of extension cord, you're gonna have voltage drop. And under certain loads and certain circumstances inside there, I was down to like 105 to 107 volts. And I got to thinking, if I go other places like RV lots or other places, I'll probably be running off extension cords and voltage drop is definitely gonna be a thing no matter where you go. So I went ahead and got a couple of giant automatic voltage regulators with power factor correction. They're very similar to backup power supplies for computers, but they have a transformer in there that is wound with multiple taps to correct over voltage and under voltage. And well, it is also an uninter uninterruptible power supply because it does have a battery in there as well. But that can correct a lot of under voltage, over voltage situations and should be able to protect the computers and other random stuff that's in there. But yeah, we're making progress here, coming right along. I think before too long, I'm gonna say, oh, I think we've got the major systems done. <laughs> Obviously we still have to do the water and the tanks and all that, but it's nice to actually see some progress after yeah, three months has it been now. <laughs> yeah. I think we're gonna call that good for now. I don't know why I'm going outside, it's dark out here. Also, I need to close the door. I came out here just to film this clip. But we're gonna call that good for now, and I will see you guys Thursday, if not sooner. Thanks for watching.